So today this is the last session I will have with you all as a group uh, and the last session of the semester. And I thought we would finish with something that is a little bit more fun than some of the, than some of the things you've been looking at. Uh, and that is the whole issue of gender and sexuality and the way in which translation, uh, speci specifically translation, not interpreting, but spe specifically written translation, um, has been uh, theorized in a way that uh, allows people to use uh, translation as a way of intervening in the kind of discourses that circulate in society, and that particularly for feminists, uh, and, and increasingly for people who are also interested in issues of sexuality, uh, the kind of discourses that circulate in society uh, um, are patriarchal in, in, origin, in origin. They express the experience of male, uh, the male sector in society and suppress the female experience. And for feminists who want to use translation as a way of fighting this patriarchal society, um, you have to dismantle language partly through translation, partly by uh, translating feminist sex, for instance, but you have to unpick the language that we use, unpick the existing discourses in order to make room for the female voice to be expressed, or the queer voice, or the lesbian voice, all those voices that are considered to be under attack in uh, our current kind of social uh, structures. Okay. So the idea uh, for, uh, for some feminists in particular is to use translation as a way of fighting sexist discourses, what they see as sexist discourses in society. And one of the ways in which they do that, for instance, in translation, is by reclaiming uh, and recovering texts that were um, written by women in previous uh, periods or translations done by women and giving them more visibility today. So the idea is that even uh, um, even kind of historically, the contributions of women, <coughs> including women translators, have been overlooked in preference for uh, giving more visibility to uh, male contributors to um, literature, to art, to every aspect of social life. So one of, one of these things that feminists do is to, to recover texts, just translate older texts that are um, written by women, for instance, and begin to give them more visibility. But the more interesting work really concerns the kind of unpicking of language itself. And this is where it gets, as you will see in a minute, it becomes quite fun. It's creative because it involves playing with being playful with language, uh, using wordplay and other ways of drawing the reader's attention to the fact that the language we use really encodes the male experience much more so than the female experience of life. And enforces our way of thinking about, uh, about these things. So if you look at the way in which feminists, it's not just translators, but feminist writers have tried to question the way uh, we use language in this respect. They've looked at things like the ordering of elements, for instance. Why do we usually say men and women? Why not women and men? <laughs> Why boys and girls? Why not girls and boys? And so uh, The use of words like man and mankind to uh, denote the whole of humanity, when, of course, humanity is much more than man. Why man? Why not woman as the default? Um, all the unfavorable connotations of feminine forms, you know, poetesses are not quite as respectable as poets. <coughs> Manageresses are low level types of, you know, uh, managerial work, uh, perhaps in retail shops rather than managers who might be uh, associated with uh, more serious types of managerial work and so on. Uh, and the use of masculine forms as unmarked forms. He and him, for instance, instead of him or her or she or he and so on. And some of the strategies that they will use to, to fight this, uh, I'll come to in a minute, are quite interesting. But they also argue that the, um, this encoding of the male experience as the default is so extensive that we don't even think about it, even conceptually. If you go back to the notion of narrative and think of conceptual narratives, you will see that even in our theoretical writings, we take this for granted. So one of the things that linguists do when they study meaning semantics is to try and break down the meanings of words that uh, belong to the same semantic domain in ways uh, 
known as componential analysis that distinguish between these different terms. And so they use different um, variables or parameters to distinguish, for instance, between boy and girl, mother and father, and so on. And usually, the, uh, the, uh, the default is that you say plus or minus male. So the difference between father and mother is that father is plus male and mother is minus male. So even here, it's the, it's the male uh, parameter that is taken as the default. So you either have it or you don't. Yeah? You have a kind of, your in, in a sense, inadequate if you're minus male. It's the, it's the standard against which other things are, um, are measured. So um, what the feminist, what feminist translators do essentially is to try and use the same strategies or cope with the same strategies that are used by feminist writers because much of what they do involves uh, translating feminist writers who themselves try to unpick language in kind of creative ways. So it's useful to look at some of the ways in which not necessarily feminist writers today, but lots of writers, even you, when you write your uh, essays, you're encouraged to write things like he or she, rather than just he as the quote. So it's become almost the norm in certain types of writing, that, uh, particularly academic writing, that people have to be aware of the way they use language and what they encode uh, through that uh, use of language. And so look at some of the strategies that um, writers now use and that feminist translators and maybe not even feminist translators specifically, but translators, any translator would have to cope with. Uh, some of the things they do is to, to use alternatives like he or she, him or her, or even better, she or he or her or him, putting the feminine first, uh, using feminine forms as uh, defaults throughout so you can go a step further and just use she as the default instead of he. Uh, you can use plural forms or indefinite pronouns like anyone, someone. Uh, this was uh, to, until recently, and still for some people, uh, considered uh, ungrammatical to use um, someone, anyone, and then pick the reference up with they rather than he. So you, so you say someone knocked on the door, they uh, sounded like you know, picking up the reference to anyone and someone by, by they instead of using he. And the alternative, alternative use of he and he, depending on what you're doing in the text, um, as a way of saying that it's neither he all the time nor she all, all the time, and to avoid the uh, implications of ordering in terms of he or she, or she or he, you just alternate between an he and she throughout the text. Sometimes you find this um, increasingly in writing or translation, actually, and sometimes people link it to what they think is the case in uh, out there in the world. And so one of the writers I was editing recently insisted on using she for community interpreters because he says most community interpreters today are she, and he for other types of interpreters perhaps where uh, there are more men than women and so on. So they use all kinds of strategies to unpick this um, habit of just going for the male as default in, uh, in our writings. There are problems, however. So for instance, Diane Blakemore, who uh, uses, um, who does this in, on this, in a, a book on pragmatics uh, called Understanding Utterances, uh, you see that what she's doing here is that she's alternating between him and her. You have, while it is true that a speaker may use language in order to communicate his beliefs and between himself and the hearer, so the speaker is he, is male, and then the hearer is becomes uh, she. So the hearer's linguistic knowledge interacts with her non-linguistic knowledge and so on. So in this bit of the text, she constructs the speaker as male and um, the hearer as female in order to balance things. But of course, you could argue that that in itself is problematic because the speaker is the more active part of the interaction and the hearer is the passive uh, part of the interaction. Okay. This is an example of what uh, writers sometimes do. This is from the Cobalt English Dictionary to avoid using they or uh, to avoid using he or she at all. And that's picking up the someone with reference to they. Now, the problem here is that these things work in languages like English. 
and even to some extent languages like French, although that becomes more cumbersome because the thing with English is that you don't have to mark verbs and uh, various pronouns and so on uh, for gender, whereas in other languages you have to. And so if I was translating this into a language like Arabic, it's practically impossible because you, just the word you, and you have to pick between you, female, or you, male, and so the strategy wouldn't work if you're translating this into other languages or if you're translating uh, bits of text that have he or she or um, her or him into other languages, it becomes even more cumbersome because it isn't just the pronoun that you have to say he or she. Every verb that occurs with the pronoun also has to be conjugated for gender. And so it becomes uh, less workable in other languages. And that is a challenge to the translator. All this politically correct language um, that is sensitive to issues of sexism is much easier to maintain and use in a language like English than uh, in other languages. So that in itself is um, a problem for translators. But even nouns like, uh, for instance, one of the things that uh, people over time have learned to avoid is nouns like chairman, for instance. So now increasingly people use things like uh, chairperson. And uh, to give you an example from interpreting, which is the kind of thing that happens, this is from um, a paper by Piaggio, which is available in the electronic resources. And it comes from an actual instance of conference interpreting, I think it was at the European She's Union, where the speaker uh, started by saying to the chair, who was a woman, the chair of uh, that particular <laughs> session, Madam Chairman, and then they started correcting themselves over, you know, Madam Chairperson, then Madam Chairwoman, then Madam Chair Lady, and then Madam Chair. <laughs> the interpreter is having to cope with this all the time. And eventually, the woman herself, the chair, said, I'd rather you call me a man than a piece of furniture. <laughs> Which, of course, caused a lot of problems for the interpreters in the various booths because that kind of wordplay doesn't work in other languages. Okay? So, all this kind of sensitivity. Uh, however uh, interesting and uh, laudable it is, all, the, all these kinds of sensitivities to issues of uh, gender and also sexuality to some extent do cause problems for interpreters and translators. Now one of the areas which um, uh, is particularly interesting in this respect and was perhaps one of the most resistant initially to uh, being cleaned up for sexist language is uh, translations of the Bible and even more so translations of the Quran, even uh, although just in the last two or three years, I think there has been uh, what claims to be a feminist translation of the Quran, but that's kind of a very recent uh, development. But um, since perhaps the early 1990s, there have been attempts at revisiting the, uh, the Bible and translations of the Bible in order to eliminate what are considered traces of sexist language. And as you see on the handout, I've kind of summarized the argument for you. There are those people who say that, you know, there's no two ways about it. The Bible is just sexist, is what it was written by men for men and so on. And there's nothing you can do about it. And other people who say, no, the, the message of God is meant for all uh, human beings. And it's just that the translations are not um, bringing this message across and therefore we have to revise the Bible in order to uh, make it clearer that the message is addressed to um, to all uh, human beings. Although in all revisions of the Bible that's one thing you will never see changed and that is God is male. So whatever else happens, God is always male. That, that bit has not been <laughs> touched yet. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what happens in translations of the Quran to make the Quran less sexist, but, uh, but these have been attempted this way. What happens in Bible translation is that things like son of God becomes child of God, king or kingdom is, are replaced with things like monarch or ruler, and things like brethren uh, are replaced by uh, sisters and uh, brothers. Uh, a relatively recent translation of the Bible, which is very interesting in this respect, is called At the Start, Genesis Made New by Mary Phil Corsack. If you look it up on Google, you will see a lot of writings about it. It's a, actually, I think, a very beautiful translation, although we once had uh, one of the um, kind of chairs of 
a committee of Bible translation here to give a seminar to students, and he was absolutely mad at it. Mm -hmm. and, you know, he just thought it was awful; it should never have been published, and so on. So there's a lot of tension, of course, among uh, Bible translators themselves as to what you can do with the Bible and how far you can go with this kind of thing. But I'll show you an example of what she does now. Uh, this is from the dust jacket of the book, and it explains what you are, uh, what you expect to find in it. It says contemporary readers are likely to find here thrilling confirmation of their own deepest religious convictions. Ecologists will be delighted to find that in its original form, Genesis is for the conservation of the earth and the basis <coughs> exploitation. Feminists will be delighted to learn that Genesis is not sexist. Adam is not translated as man, but accurately and androgynously as groundling. The woman is not created as the leftover from Adam's body, but simultaneously. Nor did God curse Eve and let Adam of the book. Rather, both will suffer, both will achieve. So this is a translation that sets out to bring that message across to revise the Bible along these terms. And this is what it looks like, bits of it. Elohim created the groundling, not Adam. Groundling, something that comes out of the ground. Um, not a word that I think is was you know traditionally part of English. In his image, created it in the image of Elohim, male and female created them, Elohim blessed them, Elohim said to them, be fruitful, increase, fill the earth, subject it, govern the fish of the sea, the, the fowl of the skies, every beast that creeps on the earth. So it's a groundling and created it, not him, in the image of Elohim, male and female. So the idea is that that groundling had within it both male and female initially and then it split. Uh, as opposed to the usual story of God um, creating Adam first and then out of Adam's rib or whatever, depending on the story, uh, comes this other creature which is uh, female, which is a secondary, you know, second, second source as well. Okay. This is um, part of a, uh, an article that came out in the International Herald Trib Tribune in 1990 about another Bible translation, an, an earlier one to this, which was also uh, um, meant to kind of uh, tackle issues of sexism and says the translation of the Bible that uses contemporary language, eliminating many male-centered terms and all the archaic these and vows has been officially introduced for use in the nation's major Protestant churches. And it's not just, uh, Sexism. In addition to the issue of male-centered language, the translators try to be sensitive to issues of race and, and homosexuality. These things, these things tend to come together. As you saw in the previous one, it was also issues of ecology. So, you know, issues of being sensitive to language and the effect of language on the way we see the world, uh, tend, these issues tend to come together in uh, translation projects so that it is rarely the case that people just focus on sexism or just focus on uh, issues of sexuality and so on. They, they try to bring several things together. So um, it says in the Song of Solomon, for example, the new translations, uh, the tr new translation uses black and beautiful rather than the old dark but comely, as if can't be, you know, if you're dark, you can't be comely, which suggests that dark is usually not comely. A text in, is it 1 Corinthians or 5 Corinthians, I don't know, which has been translated from the Greek in the old version as sexual perverts, of course, a terrible term to use in relation to um, homosexuals, now uses a more literal and possibly, possibly, not quite, less judgmental translation of male prostitutes and so on. <laughs> okay? So uh, the Bible is a big site for uh, linguistic exp experiments of this type. And of course, most of the Bibles we consume are translations. So the translators play quite an important part here in uh, renegotiating the language of the original in order to make space for new ways of thinking about the relationship between men, women, God, and what we're doing on this earth. And it's another example of, I. I gave you another example from uh, uh, South African translations of the Bible earlier when we talked about narrative theory. And this is, these are really just other examples. If you want to think in terms of narrative theory, these are further examples of the way in which uh, canonical texts like the Bible provide ways of re-narrating the world so that people can begin to see themselves in different roles, narrate themselves in different ways, uh, elaborate new personal narratives of themselves so that they're more in, 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 in sync with 
um, the new narrative of the mm -hmm. world as it emerges. Okay, Bible aside, feminists uh, produce the kind of text that feminist translators want to translate and promote because they are part of the same agenda. And feminists are extremely playful with language, uh, as I said, because they see part, major part of the problem being the language that you use. They have to unpick that language, take it apart, make room for the female voice. They actually talk about women handling the text, not just you know, translating the text, but women handling the text. And therefore, they uh, come up with all kinds of uh, interesting ways of making readers and users of, of the language more aware of the, the extent to which male experience is encoded as the quote in the language. So one of the most famous feminist writers, Mary Daly, um, wrote one of the texts in which she uses a, one of these typical strategies, which is to introduce discontinuities in the language in such a way that you begin to read what is familiar, what you never thought about, as another instance of uh, the male experience uh, coming through stronger than the female experience. So in, in, um, in this particular bit of the text, uh, one of the famous texts, she is talking about conceptions of paradise in the Bible and elsewhere, and the way in which paradise is really conceptualized from a very male point of view. Paradise is where you, I don't know, you get virgins in heaven and you get women and all kinds of things, uh, at least in some, uh, in some uh, theological uh, interpretations. And so she says, despite theological attempts to make this, this vision of paradise seem lively, the image is one of stagnation. And we all know what stagnation is, you know, lack of movement, lack of dynamism, and so on. And then she puts between brackets, stagnation. She introduces that dash, uh, an element of discontinuity. Uh, does, do people know what stagnite is? Yeah? No? Stag, uh, stagnite, as I understand it, is the, uh, I shouldn't be explaining this, somebody <laughs> else should. Uh, stagnite is the night before the wedding, normally. Not well, always. Not always. Well, some night before the wedding, maybe a few days, but prior to the actual wedding, uh, and the equivalent of that in Britain is hen night for, for women. But stagnite is where the men get together and they go and have a good time because it's maybe the last time the room will have the kind of freedom you may not have after marriage. And so the idea they is to get, they get drunk perhaps, you know, also enjoy sex and, and various other distractions. Um, and so stagnation is broken down into stagnation as a play on stagnite, which, which is, you know, the, the idea of freedom for men, the idea of enjoyment for men in that kind of context. So other types of discontinuities that they introduce, very problematic <laughs> translation. You have to uh, you have to be as creative as these feminists if you're going to translate them properly. Uh, therapist, you know, therapist, somebody who uh, offers psychological help becomes the rapist. Uh, madness is so the dash is one way of introducing discontinuities. Another way is to use a combination of capital letters and small letters. And uh, madness, male approved desire to refer to those women who feel they have to be approved by men in order to, you know, feel adequate. Um, of course, if you are translating into a language like Arabic, which doesn't have the distinction between capitals and, and uh, lowercase and uppercase letters, then you, you haven't got that strategy to use. Uh, human, human rights, not you woman, right? And even in other languages like German, where I'm not quite sure how to pronounce this, is it Perlik? Perlik, um, which means something like pretty, funny, uh, depends on the context, yeah? Uh, but here the uh, italics is used to uh, uh, make more visible the male element, her, which means man, right? So these are some of the strategies that are used by um, by feminists and that call for equally creative strategies on the part of the translators who, who translate them. Other things that they use is false etymologies. So history in very Daniel's writings becomes her story. <laughs> of course, it's false etymology because that's not the etymology of the world at all. It has nothing to do with this at all. But it's false etymology. This is another uh, example which is on your handout. 
um, in, um, in French. I won't try to read that because my French is awful, but it literally means what is the feminine of boy, it's love. And you have the uh, garçon and gars are appear on the surface to be cognates, but it's not it's not real etymology, it's false etymology. And this is translated by Suzanne uh, de Locke as what's the feminine of dog, it's bitch. You have to find a way of getting the message uh, across. Okay, so of course, bitch has all the um, kind of awful connotations that uh, are also part of the meaning of slut. They also go for the shock effect, and so um, Nicole Brassard was one. It was a very famous um, uh, feminist writer. Writes in French. In one of her books, she. she um, says the soir rentre dans l'histoire sans le ma jupe, which the traditional non-feminist translator translated very closely as this evening I'm entering history without pulling up my skirt. The feminist translator will go for a more shocking rendition, which is this evening I'm entering history without opening my legs. So the shock treatment is also one of the strategies that, uh, that they use to deliver um, their message. Uh, all kinds of other ways of being playful with language to get the message across. So again, Nicole Brossard has a, um, a novel entitled La Main in French. Um, who speaks French here and say what La Main means and what kind of elements constitute it. This is a book about uh, how uh, women, mothers who have been suppressed in their own life and made to fit the kind of female mold that is uh, expected in society, come to internalize all these um, ideas about what a woman should be like and how she should behave and so on. And then when they have daughters, they um, enforce the same way of life on their daughters so that they suffocate their daughters in the same way that they themselves have been suffocated and drowned by um, you know, the, the values of the societies in which they grew up. So lame, I understand it's not quite a, a regular French it's, word. It's a play on words because la mer is uh, encoded for, you know, you can, you can uh, encode gender in the form of the verb, for instance. And so this, uh, this bit of the text, it's a text about uh, a woman who gets pregnant and she has an abortion. And um, the author writes, the feminist author writes, Who's to blame for this situation? Why does she have to have an abortion or in and so on? And so uh, in French, uh, the idea that the woman is always the one to blame because she's supposed to have control of her body and not you know, have this happen. It's as if she gets pregnant on her own, as it were. Um, it, the, this is signaled by the uh, ending E for feminine. So you know that she's the one who should be punished for this. Uh, this is not available in English. You can't, sig you can't inflect the verb for, for gender to, to do this. And so the feminist translator um, very playfully translates this as the, gu the guilty one must be punished whether she is a man or a woman. <laughs> it's very playful. It's constantly the reader is, is being drawn into um, colluding with the translator or with the author in, in questioning all these values. Again, manipulating grammar, um, some of the things French uh, feminist writers and translators do is to drop the silent E uh, at the end of uh, nouns as a way of saying uh, it is silent anyway. It reflects the fact that the female experience is silenced. So why pretend it's there? Let's drop it all together. It's very clever, but again, very subtle. You could argue very elitist um, strategies. It's one of the criticisms of this type of of work there is that it's it's so elitist that you really have to be on the ball to notice what they're doing anyway sometimes. Uh, or to, in, to introduce an E that is not there, as in the Quebec um, uh, up the top. And those feminists and feminist translators who try to mimic some of these strategies in English, because a lot of this work is done mainly in North America, whether in Canada, French speaking, English speaking, or the United States. So a lot of it is really between English and, uh, and French. English just doesn't oblige. It doesn't have that kind of uh, 
visible gender encoding uh, in its grammar that allows you to play uh, with the language the way the, the French writers do. And so some of the things that, uh, I don't know if you can see it at all actually from, from where you are, um, extremely subtle, too subtle probably for most readers to notice, is that they will put something like the E in one in bold. Can you see that from where you are? Mm -hmm. So no one ignores the fact that everything uh, is language or a mute one speaks to a deaf one as if the, the reader will suddenly see the, you know, the E in bold and realize that this is a feminist message. And this is one of the major criticisms of feminist translators is that they sometimes seem to be talking amongst themselves. You have to be already in the know and part of the group to notice this kind of experimentation with language. It's also the kind of um, um, criticism that is often directed at people like Lawrence Venuti. So when Lawrence Venuti talks about um, encoding resistance in the language of translation, um, making sure that the reader is alert to the fact that they are reading the translation and therefore confronted with the fact that there are other cultures and that, that they have to accept these cultures on their own terms and so on. And then he gives you examples like uh, using uh, British spelling in an American book published in America. So instead of writing perhaps uh, H-U-M-O-R for humor, writing H-U-M-O-U-R. And so these, these kinds of little things that uh, for many people, even if they notice them, they might notice them, but even if they notice them, how will they link that to what the author or the translator is actually trying to communicate? These are um, kinds of experimental uses of language that people have often criticized as elitist and as not really delivering the political message that people claim to be delivering. Um, and that the, the strategies that people like feminists use often uh, and people like Venuti use are uh, far, their talk about them far outstrips what the strategies actually deliver uh, in real life. So that's one of the major criticisms. And this is a very good example of that. I mean, that is really ob this is really obscure. It's, uh, you're, you're lucky if, if, if it gets noticed at all, never mind interpreted in the right way. Also, one of the things that uh, they do is uh, to challenge machismo writers. So Suzanne Jane Levine in particular, she, uh, if you search on, on her on, uh, on Google, you will find a lot of stuff about her and the writers, the Latin American writers that she translates. And she often chooses writers who are actually quite nasty to women, quite unfavorable in their depictions of women, uh, which you would think she would just leave aside, but she chooses them. She doesn't do that on her own. She actually has you know, long correspondence with the authors and she, she discusses things with them, but she tries to undermine their message. And so uh, the Cuban writer Cabrera Infante, for instance, in one of his books, uh, talks about women who get raped in such a way as to suggest that they get raped because they want to be raped. You know, that, and so that, so and, and hence, no one man can rape a woman. You know, it's a single man, single woman. If she doesn't want to get raped, she won't be raped. There has to be a gang, you know, to to, to justify that. And she changes this to no we man can rape a woman. Perhaps if he's a small man, <laughs> but if he's an ordinary or big man, then uh, so so she actually subverts the message, but in collaboration with the writer, um, and they have joy and fun and pleasure in arguing amongst them, you know, uh, about these things. Okay, so far? And finally, just one last area I will mention before we conclude is the uh, whole issue of the metaphorics of gender. So uh, this is Laurie Chamberlain in particular. She's the only one who's written extensively on this. And this is from uh, an entry on the metaphorics of gender in the first edition of the Routledge Encyclopedia. A very interesting e uh, entry. She's also written in several other um, places, but really recycling the same thing. And what she's saying is that, again, we we'll go back to conceptual na narratives, and specifically conceptual narratives about translation. And she says that even the way we talk about translation encodes the uh, metaphors of gender that say something about how we conceptualize relationships between men and women in society. And so she says the terms of fidelity used in discussions of translation may differ, whether it is the spirit of the letter that one must serve, whether it is best to be servile, 
before the original or to dominate it as one would a captive slave, but the marked term is usually gendered female. Thus, theories of translation have been peopled metaphorically with chaste maidens, mistresses, and unfaithful lovers. We talk about libel and fidel, you know, a translation is either beautiful or loyal, but it can't be both, just like a woman, if she's too beautiful, she's going to be unfaithful, and if she's ugly, then she'll be faithful. <laughs> Um, translators have worried that the process of translation may violate the purity of the mother tongue and that bastards would be bred. Translators have worried equally over the virility of the original and the complaint is frequently that the original has been emasculated. The act of translating has been compared to sex and to rape and so on. Um, it's an, you know, you can read the whole uh, entry in the encyclopedia. She gives many examples from actual writings on the translations of the story. Uh, and shows that even in our conceptualization of translation, we, we take for granted these, these gendered metaphors without questioning them, without trying to, um, to challenge the way in which you know, the translation, which is the secondary derivative thing, is always female, and the original, which is the primary you know, virile uh, source of, of all things, is, uh, is, gender, is metaphorically configured as male. And it's this translation that has to be faithful to um, to the source, not the other way around, of course, as in real life. People talk about women being faithful mostly to the translation. Okay? Right, so overall, various criticisms, and you'll, you'll have some of these, you have some of these on your handout, include the elitism of this kind of work, the fact that it is quite elitist. Some of the writings, I, I put a, an example on your handout. Uh, of people who are central to, to this kind of work. Some of these writings are, are for instance, um, written in several languages at the same time, so you read a stretch of text, and if you don't know French, English, Portuguese, and something else like Greek, you can't follow what they're saying anyway. So obviously, although these texts and their translations claim to be wanting to change the, the way in which things are configured in society, the fact that they are simply talking amongst themselves to elitist uh, groups undermines the, uh, what they say, uh, the agenda uh, they are working for. Um, the texts tend to be produced in academic settings and very often come with a very heavy apparatus of footnotes and, um, and so on, which again means that they are not in mainstream society but very much within an academic setting. Um, but in recent years, there have been uh, various, you know, various people have written uh, about um, issues to do with, for example, the way in which also uh, first world feminist writers like Barbara Goddard or Nicole Brossar and so on talk about issues of gender as if they represent all women in the world. And um, people have said that women in third world countries, for example, where they face much, much more serious issues than whether uh, people use he as a default for he or she or not. They have much more pressing issues to address, are not really interested in these linguistic experiments. They are interested in changing conditions on the ground. But you could argue, of course, as some feminists do, that one way of changing things on the ground is to open up the language and question it in ways that uh, that make people more alert to what is happening on the ground. And one of the papers that I uh, put on your handout and put on the intranet for you to read if you're interested in that is also about the way in which uh, first world women translators can appropriate third world women in ways that are not in the least bit feminist but uh, showing no uh, sense of solidarity at all uh, this is the paper by Mohja Kaf, and it's about the translation of a woman uh, writer. Uh, again, it's all to do with whether you can call certain women writers in certain periods of time in certain societies feminists, because the word feminist comes with a whole package and ideas about what these people were about. Um, but the way in which this Egyptian writer was uh, translated by an American translator, uh, projecting her as a, as a feminist and therefore undercutting what she was trying to do in her own society. So appropriating her for an agenda for which 
she, she was not committed. But also associating her at the same time with visions of the harem and so on in ways that, again, don't reflect her own experience of life. So the idea is not, it's not just you know, men against women, but also some women uh, are guilty of the same excesses, perhaps, in, in some ways, as some of the male members of society. And of course, people now have gone on to issues of masculinity as well. That hasn't reached translation studies yet, but work on gender now also looks at issues of masculinity, the idea being that when society conceptualizes the relationship between men and women in the way that it does, it is not just women who are victims, it's also men, because it's also men who have to live up to particular images that a lot of men are not comfortable with. You know, the fact that you know it's not manly to cry, for instance, however much in pain you might be. So that the, these uh, images of femininity, masculinity, are not uh, uh, are not oppressive to women only, but also to, to men. 